project here. I am a small business expert, and you are listening to the Startup Show, or that's what we're calling it this week, with Roger Pierce and Lily Ma. And I'll introduce Lily in just a second. Why are we here today? We're here today to answer questions that are being posted on Evan Carmichael's channels, on his YouTube channel, on his website. Evan gets a lot of questions, so we're hoping to lighten the load by answering some of the follower questions he receives about starting and running a small business. And that's certainly my background. I've had 13 small businesses, crazy as that may sound. And I've trained thousands of entrepreneurs over the years in different parts of the world. And I'm also co-author of a startup book. Mm -hmm. And my current company produces small business content like books, eBooks, articles, videos, infographics, seminars and webinars that we sell to corporations who want to reach small business customers like you folks tuning in here today. A little bit of my background, hopefully we'll get to share a little bit more as we go throughout this half hour. But really I want you to meet Lily Ma, who is coach, trainer, and entrepreneur extraordinaire. Oh, I love it. Coach, trainer, and extraordinaire. I think that's what you said. Hello everyone, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, so Roger, I do want to go back to the point that you said to lighten up the load a little bit with all the questions that we had. The truth is, you know, it's not about lightening up the load. I think Roger Pierce brings an amazing amount of value and it's so great to see your perspective on things because the way we answer our questions might be different from you. So it's always really good to have all different parts of it. So it's not only lightening up the load, Roger, you're adding a lot of value and it's very, very much appreciated. Whatever you want to say, Lily, I'll take it. All right. Okay, so why don't we get right into it? And hopefully we're going to have some people join in in the live as well. I did invite the folks that asked these questions onto our live event. If they don't catch it um, during a live event, maybe they could catch in the replay, but they will, they will have access to this. Okay, so the first question comes from Michael. Michael says, I'm a vendor looking to partner up with retailers. How do you approach the situation to put your best foot forward when you meet these potential clients? Uh, what, can I, what can I offer them to do business with me? I'm a startup and I don't have customers yet. Hmm. Very good question. Well, Michael, hello and thank you for submitting your, your query. I'm going to make a couple of assumptions from your comments that you are selling to smaller independent retailers and not the big box chains like a Walmart or a Staples. That's a different strategy that we can address at a later time. So let's assume you're selling to you know mom and pop stores on Main Street. I think in any selling situation it's important to get to know the name of the person you want to sell to. So do a little research before you blindly send in an email or pick up the phone and just call a store. If you can find the contact person within the organization, hopefully there's just a few people working there, it's not a big deal to do. But the person who's gonna make the decisions, maybe the owner, maybe it's a manager, maybe it's someone in charge of buying products for resale. Find out who that person is, it's gonna make you much more effective. Next, you wanna go in there and put your best foot forward, as you say, by looking professional and making it easy and pleasant for retailers to do business with you. I think you should create an online catalog. Lots of great websites available for you to do that. Just search online. You know, create a nice online catalog of your products so that retailers can really see well-lit images of what you're selling so that when you make contact, you can just refer them to your online catalog. You know, list your prices very clearly and any discounts for volume purchases. I think it's also important to put on the site or maybe in your sales material your credit terms and you know, any kind of generous credit terms you can offer to creditors. You're gonna to wanna to put up a credit application as well so that anyone who wants to buy from you on credit, which is payable 30 days, 60 days, 120 days kind of thing, can fill out the application form fairly easily and get a quick response from you and your team. If you're looking for a lot of retailers, I would say, get a booth at a trade show or some industry event where they, they come to. There are lots of great shows. I'm in Toronto right now. There's shows every year that happen that are just specifically for uh, vendors looking to meet retailers. So find out where they, what those are in your community, in your city or town, or even a nearby city or town, and see what it costs to take out a booth. Might be the best way 
to get a whole bunch of customers fairly quickly. End of the day though, Michael, you've got to convince one retailer to take you on. It starts with that. Once you get one, you've got some credibility because you can leverage future customers and say, hey, look, the store owner at ABC uh, Designs is, is buying from us. Therefore, we hope you will too. It really just takes someone to give you a break and I don't mind asking for that break if you think you've earned the sale from the retail. Mm, that's a good point. I do want to let you know, Roger, that Michael is watching. Uh, so he, uh, he made a comment. And uh, so I'm going to put it back on Michael as well that um, if he has any follow-up questions he can ask. Uh, my question to you is assuming that Michael is completely a startup, like he, he doesn't have a website yet and uh, he's looking to get credit information, where do we go about application? How do you even start that process? Sorry, you cut out a bit there. You mean a credit application? Uh, you mentioned that uh, put, in, put in your credit term. So in the retail world where I come from, we have different like net 30 days or sometimes there's a discount as well. How, how can a person who's just starting out um, get that type of information? Contact Equifax or TransUnion. Those are the, the okay. biggest ones. Okay. I believe in North America and they'll be able to help you. They've got, of course, a service for companies like Michael's that are looking to check the credit status of potential customers. Okay. You know, in an ideal world, there will be no credit issued. <laughs> You'll just take the, the retailer's credit card mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you don't have to worry about giving them terms or chasing down their payments. But most retailers, including the world's biggest, like Walmart, mm -hmm. don't, pay, don't pay the manufacturer, the wholesaler, until the sale is made. So you really have to play within the rules of the industry. Yeah, I, uh, I come from that world. I come from the other side. I am the big box retailer. Oh so I, I understand coming from both perspectives as well. Uh, so it sounds to me that in Michael's situation, he's a vendor. So there is a product that he's trying to sell to these retailers. Now, in the beginning, it's going to be hard to come up with the funds to actually create the product. So for example, if Michael lands a deal, and he he sells a thousand units of his product. Funding that. What if you don't have enough money to fund your manufacturing of your product? It's the the best of the worst case scenario, right? You've got a great sale, yay! I sold a thousand units, and then you the reality sinks in. How do I pay for those those units to be produced? Yeah. And fortunately, there are a few financing options available. And of course, a relationship with your bank or a pre-approved line of credit would be one option. So you pay to get the work done, get the products produced, and then ship them. A lot of business owners don't have that kind of line of credit. We might be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, factoring is another, another example of finance for, for people selling to retailers. So in a factoring situation, a third party, a factoring company, will basically buy your your um, your, your invoice and, and they'll finance your, the production of your products or services and usually take about five to ten percent hopefully it's only five percent of the order um, value and give it to you so in other words you'll get 95 percent of whatever the retailer ordered to produce the product and then ship it and then the factor collects on that invoice 100 percent Nice, nice. Those are all really good tips. And then Michael also made a comment that he likes your uh, trade show idea. So maybe he'll try that as well. Good. good. Well, thank you, Roger. It's also good to have someone live as well, right? So you're directly speaking to him, and I'm sure Michael really appreciates it. Okay, so the second one is from Kyle. Kyle is asking, what is the best practice to hiring an employee? So for example, a marketing person. Well, congratulations, Kyle. If you're hiring, that means your business is up and running and, and presumably doing well. So a couple of thoughts. I've hired dozens of people over the years. Some of them continue to be friends to this day. But I learned a few things that I would do differently, and hopefully I can share those with you today. Number one, you've got to find people. And how do you do that? Online is your first option, of course. Sites like Indeed.com or even by trolling through LinkedIn. LinkedIn makes a lot of money uh, connecting employee, employee applicants with employers. I like to go through my business network. If you've got some connections, you share the job description that you're trying to fill. 
to see if any of your colleagues or even your personal connections can refer someone. Most people find work through a network. Most employers also find employees through a network. So don't discount that option. So once you've got some people to interview, you're going to line them up for an interview. I would strongly recommend a panel interview, Kyle. The thing is, as an entrepreneur, as an owner, you might get very enthused about one individual. You need a couple other people to be a sounding board and to maybe see things in the applicant that you don't see. Maybe you're excited about the applicant for one reason, but your uh, colleagues sitting on the panel can look for other, other things that, that perhaps you're missing and give you a broader perspective on that applicant's suitability for the job. It just sort of is a hedge against being, being, being charmed by the applicant too much during the application process or the interview process. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fun, being charmed. Exactly. But if you've got a, a good one and you come across someone who, who makes it through the panel interview successfully, the next step should be to give them an assignment, mm. especially if you're talking about a marketing role. Mm -hmm. Lily, you'll agree. You want someone mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. can, can walk the talk. All right, so if you've got marketing chops, how about you do a two page marketing plan for my business. Yes. You could ask the applicant to sit down and do it in a quiet room on the spot. More likely you're going to say, take this home and give it back to me by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. When they respond, it's not so much what they say in the marketing plan. They don't really know your business that well yet, but it's, you know, a chance for you to assess their, their writing skills, their ability to meet a deadline. Did they get it in by nine o'clock? Can they formulate reasonable thoughts? Are they persuasive? Whatever you're looking for in the job description, it's going to come through in that mm. test, really. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that part of it. I myself am going to be hiring my first employee very soon. Yay. So I'm looking at, yeah, I know, it's good. It's, it's a good day when you could, it's, it's a good problem to have, right? Trying to find an employee. I love that. I think, um, I mean, the, the, the companies are becoming different now and things are changing in terms of the hiring process. But I remember, you know, a long time ago when I was looking for a job myself, I found the interviewing process easy to trick. Because like you said, if you're charmed by someone, someone could be a really good speaker and really captivate you and be very compelling, but are they actually right for their job? So I love the fact that you brought in the project um, because that's what they're hired to do. They're not hired to be a speaker unless that's the role that they have. But if they're hired to do a marketing, do a project, see how well they work within deadline. And also, I think if in Kyle's situation, it sounds to me that he, he doesn't have employees, so he's doing everything on his own. So he has a good grasp in what a marketing person should be doing because he's been doing it himself. So a great way to kind of be the, um, be the judge of that for himself. So I love that piece. So I'm just going to underscore that. I love it. I love it. I'm going to be using that for myself, <laughs> for my employee. <laughs> well, just, just to even further hedge your bets a bit, you know, so you hire the person. There's nothing wrong with saying you're on probation for three to six months. So you've got the job, welcome aboard. However, you're still under scrutiny for the first, first few months of employment. That gives you a bit of a chance to really test the person out in the, in the role to see if they perform the way you, you think. Right. And the, la the last step, of course, for our legal friends out there is always, always, always prepare an employment letter or contract okay. so that both parties, the employee and the employer, are quite clear on what the roles are, what the hours are, what the responsibilities include, what the compensation level is, mm -hmm. bonuses, sick days, or time off, rather, whatever you choose to negotiate, and grounds for termination so that if the employee doesn't fulfill your expectations as to find an agreement, you've got a reasonable out. I love it. So uh, in, since we're talking about startups, for startups who don't really know where to begin, where to start, where would Kyle find terms and regulations he can go to? The best thing about small business is most of the things you're after are available by robbing and duplicating, uh, Lily. So. You can go online and search for employment contracts, letters of employment. Maybe you've got a, a business owner colleague who can share something they've done and you just modify it. Okay. There are te template sites out there that allow you to kind of plunk in the particulars yeah. to a standard legal uh, language. Mm -hmm. um, you can find most of the stuff online. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Next question. Next question comes from Dan. He says, I have such a great business idea. 
that my that my initial concern was that the elevator ride would be too long. I'm not sure exactly what he means by the elevator ride. I'm, I'm assuming it's from a metaphor perspective. He said, it's both a product and a service. How do I raise money without giving the game away? I think what Dan's referring to is the elevator pitch. Mm, okay. And uh, the old joke is, you know, you need to have your, you need to be able to pitch your idea succinctly in the time it takes you to get on an elevator and get off on the 17th floor. So okay. you better have it down to a minute or less if you're in front of an investor or a lender or some other stakeholder. So right. okay. I think what he's saying is it's such a great idea, it's going to take me too long to get it across. But Dan, your, your, your concern is very common. Most entrepreneurs don't want to share their idea, and it makes me smile because I often think that way too. But here's some, some ideas to make you think a little differently. The truth is, I think you need to talk about your idea openly because you're going to get feedback, you're going to get reaction, you're going to get people who want to collaborate with you, you're going to get people who want to invest with you. So the more you share your idea, I think the stronger it becomes. By sharing it up front, you'll also get, like I said, fast response and reaction to the idea, in which case you might just decide to abandon the idea or give it up because, hey, maybe it's not as terrific as you thought. If a thousand people say it's not the greatest idea for this reason or that reason, maybe it's time to have a rethink. Mm -hmm. However, if you do want to keep talking to people but you want to do it with some safety, I recommend a couple of actions. You can ask people to sign a non-disclosure agreement. That's fairly standard, or an NDA. Again, NDA forms are available online. Punch in your particulars, and you can have an NDA document or ask your lawyer to draft one out. And the idea is usually you attach the NDA to a business plan or a business summary that you've created. Just a couple of pages outlining the idea, what it's involved, what the market is, how much money you're after, what kind of stake you're offering or shares and then um, attach the NDA to that and just share it with a limited number of people. That might give you a little bit of comfort. But again, I would encourage you to err on the side of openness and, and, and really talk it up with people because you're going to make it that much stronger. What are your right. thoughts, Lily? I think so too. I think uh, we all have ideas. We have great, like everyone has ideas, right? Uh, the key is the execution part of it. And if Dan is wholeheartedly afraid because he does have such a great idea that he could get a patent on, I think you don't, you could still pitch your idea without giving away all the specifics. Yep. I'm not. Yep. You can. You're right. You, you raised a good point. You don't have to give them the super nuts version. You just give them the, the ten thousand foot. Uh, view version, right? Here's what we want to do. Here's what we're going to do it for. Here's what we need the money for. Here's our team. Kind of like a summary of the idea. Yeah. But at the end of the day, this notion of someone else stealing it, people have their own ideas they want to pursue. And, and, and unless we're talking about some really sensitive IP, like a technical, technical idea, chances are people are going to be too preoccupied with their own, their own ideas to really care about pursuing yours. I'd also like to add for, uh, for Dan, don't worry about talking with professionals like bankers, obviously lawyers, accountants. These folks are not going to steal your idea. They're in the business of advising entrepreneurs, and mm -hmm. you can trust them with your confidentiality. Right. And then as far as the, um, say, for example, for Dan, he does have an idea that he wants to patent. I know patents are very expensive to file. Is there a temporary patent that he can file? Well, I'm not a lawyer, but I would definitely speak to one. Yeah. You know, it doesn't cost a lot or some, maybe it doesn't cost anything to have a 30-minute conversation with a lawyer about things you can do for free to protect your intellectual property or a patent. There's the patent office, of course, in Canada. There are Canadian patents, American patents, worldwide patents. It's a bit of a game, but um, I would certainly go and research the, the – uh, Property op intellectual property offices and patent offices to get more information. Mm -hmm. And even if it costs you a couple hundred bucks for a, a lawyer consultation, that would be a smart investment. Okay, sounds good. I love it. All right. Last question, Roger. Last question comes from Zach. He says, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't have any solid business idea. What should I do? 
Zach, I'll sell you an idea. Just call me after this show. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta come up with your own idea. Um, so a process here. Really, there's a process to figuring out what you want to do. You're on a journey. Accept that you're on a journey, and it might take weeks. It might take years before you come up with the right business idea for you. So, number one, acknowledge that you are on a journey, and it's going to take some time. I like to ex expose entrepreneurs at this stage to as much external stimuli as possible. So attend trade shows, go to franchise shows, not saying you have to buy a franchise, but you're going to get ideas about different types of companies. Um, go to conferences, read business books, books like Your One Word by Evan Carmichael is a good place to start. Surf the web, go to entrepreneur and small business sites like entrepreneur.com, Forbes, Inc., you name it. There's thousands of sites out there. Some of them even publish the best 100 businesses to start. So they've done the research for you based on current trends and they make recommendations. You could either accept or reject. Next, I would take a personal journey, and I'm sure Lily's got some thoughts on this, but take a personal inventory rather of your talents and passions. So what are you good at doing? What do you love to do? What are you good at doing? What do you love to do? And then deciding, will someone pay you for that? Mm -hmm. So what do you love to do? What are you good at doing? And is there a market for those talents? And that's really the last step is to do the market research to make sure somebody will pay you for what you propose to do. So let's say you're a really talented graphic designer and that's your passion. There's definitely a market for that, but you're gonna to wanna to check it out based on where you live and where you propose to operate. End of the day, I would say, Zach, to don't sweat so much coming up with a completely innovative or unthought of idea. A lot of entrepreneurs worry about having something really original, and that's actually a bit of a danger because the question becomes, why hasn't someone else done that idea? Instead, I would say come up with a great idea based on something that already works in the world and then just do a little twist, right? Do it a little bit differently, make it better, make it faster, make it different. Krispy Kreme didn't invent the donuts, but they sure make them nice and hot and tasty. And that's kind of been their go-to market differentiator, right? right? Selling warm donuts. That sounds so, so good. We need to think about that, right? We need to think about what can we come up with that is a proven market but do it a little bit differently so we stand out. Yeah, uh, Krispy Kreme donuts, that is, that, that's good. I haven't had one in years. <laughs> I don't even think hungry, they eh? have it in Canada. Do they still have it here? I'm not sure. It was like a major thing when they came here. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Uh, for, uh, for Zach, I think I would even go way further back because uh, I think I'm classified as a millennial. There's a lot of millennials who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs because they are seeing the, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world doing all these fantastic things. I would take a step back to see if, um, if I do actually want to be an entrepreneur for, for Zach. The best way to do it is to get a job with a startup and see if you like the day in and day out because what you really see uh, on the surface, whether if you're looking at Instagram or if you're looking at you know, different people's stories, you're seeing their highlights. So really understanding what goes in day in and day out and even after that you still want to pursue a business idea, you still want to live the entrepreneur lifestyle, then go ahead and apply all the techniques that Roger gave you because they're all fantastic. And you know, you will find an idea that will work. And maybe if the idea if the idea doesn't work the first time around, you could try again. But it's all part of entrepreneurship and understanding that it's you're in it for the long haul. It, you know, Roger has been in this business for how many years now, Roger? Over 25 years. Over 25 years. And you probably have seen a lot of businesses come and go. And it is tough. Entrepreneurship is not something that's easy. Uh, a lot of young folks are seeing that on YouTube. There's always all these like quick, get, uh, get rich quick kind of um, things happening. And it, the, the reality is it's very hard. Understanding what goes into it is going to give you some clarity as well. I like your I like approach, it. Louis. You're playing the long haul. Love it. I'm in it for the long haul, Roger. That's what's happening with me. <laughs> well, that's great to hear. You're absolutely right. To go and get a job with someone else, you know, find out what that business is all about, and maybe there's an inspiration within that. Mm-hmm.
yeah. If you still want to do it, we have fantastic, you know, strategies and tactical advice that Roger gave us that could really, really help someone. So I love all of that. I enjoy continuously learning too from people around me. I've got um, um, one of my business partners in, in town and country this week, actually, all the way from New Zealand, if you can believe it or believe it. Okay. And uh, we've been working together for a few years, but mostly it's through Skype and whatnot. But whenever, whenever he's here, I always learn a thing or two from, from him and his perspective. And I think that's part of the fun part of, be, of being an entrepreneur, especially starting a business, is mm -hmm. you learn so many things from the people around you. Even if you've been in entrepreneurship for many years like I have, you still continue to learn every day. And I think that just makes us stronger. Oh, I love it. I love it. So those are all the questions I have. I love that you ended it by saying, you know, continue to learn because it's just, it's a never ending journey. And you said that it's a journey. Anything that you do that is meaningful, it's a journey. You're in it for the long haul and continue to learn. Is there one resource that you would uh, recommend the folks watching either or in the replay that they can go to to continue to learn about entrepreneurship? one resource that they can go to to learn about entrepreneurship. Well, there's so many great ones out there. Wow. That's why I'm giving you the creative constraint for one. <laughs> <laughs> one good resource. Well, let me yeah. think about that. I find the best resource, and maybe it's not one resource, Lily, but is any entrepreneur networking event or place where like-minded individuals gather. If you go to meet up, Dot com. There are thousands of small business and entrepreneurship groups in, in, in most cities and towns around the world. Maybe you know of one. Maybe it's your local chamber of commerce. But go to one of their events, whether it's just a coffee event or a luncheon or a dinner or a networking night or a trade show. Surround yourself with small business owners. And I guarantee you, you'll find pro uh, some solutions to any of your problems when you talk to other small business owners. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Like so, uh, surround yourself with encouraging positive people and also like-minded people because you may have amazing friends, but if they're not entrepreneurs, they might not understand what it is that you're going through. So I love it. I love That's it. That's a very key point. My parents to this day support my entrepreneurship journey, but I'm not quite sure they entirely understand it. Yeah, so. which is why you have your own um, group of people that you turn to. That's right. You you got your own network to support you and bounce ideas off of and bring you down when you're when you're feeling a little a little beaten up or discouraged. Yeah, I love it. So um, Roger, we did get a couple of live people while we were chatting. So Teen Ho said hello and he's asking you, what's up, Roger? Do you know Teen Ho? I don't. Well, apparently he knows you. So um, for the people watching, we are going to be ending very soon. But if you do have any questions, please write it in the comments. And that way, Roger and I can answer your questions next Tuesday. So we meet here every single Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Perfect. Thank you all very much for joining us here today. And hopefully we've answered a few of your questions and given you a bit more insight into the world of starting up a small business. And if that's your journey, we are here to help. I want to thank you, Lily, so much for your time and finding these awesome questions, really good questions. Good. I love it. They make me think and they make me, uh, make me happy that people are asking good questions and everyone's on their own path. So please come back again next week, right, Lily? Yes, we're here next week, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. So much. <laughs>